So I'll be talking and I'll be kicking things off uh, and, and basically setting the stage for the rest of the day as well. I'll, I'll try to do both at the same time. My topic is a bit vague, as you can see, moving to a value chain from a supply chain. But really what I want to touch upon today is, is basically the whole API economics side of things. Uh, the economics story about how to build a successful API platform and what it takes to build uh, a successful API strategy. Uh, again, this is new for all of us. Everyone's working from home, everyone's remote. So if you hear my kids running around, don't mind that. Uh, usually people will introduce me. I'm, I'm sure they were, you would agree. And then there's like this whole room standing up, a standing ovation, right? And now I, all I hear is crickets. So, so okay, we don't know. Hopefully everyone's clapping at home. All right, uh, let's get started. Uh, yesterday, we had a number of good sessions, as Devaka mentioned. Uh, Asanka spoke about the whole integrated digital supply chain and how APIs play into that. Uh, Ginger basically spoke about the customer side of things, uh, and, and which, is, which is very relevant, and I'll be quoting some of them here. Uh, Nuan spoke about the API factory and why APIs are the product of the 21st century. Uh, and we have we had really good sessions from BC Ferries. We we basically had really in-depth domain sessions uh, from the healthcare sector, uh, so on and so forth. Right. So they're really great sessions, and I'll try to tie that into this presentation and then uh, make way for the next presentation as well. If we if we were again live uh, with a live audience, of course, like in 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 an on-premise setting, I would ask what this diagram means. Of course, I'm not going to get an answer now. Uh, so basically, uh, this is this is the Rubik's cube, of course, right? As you know, and and my son is into Rubik's cube, but Rubik's cubes is one of the top ten selling, best selling toys of all time, and in some lists, it comes under one of the top ten best selling products of all time, alongside Coca Colas and and multiple things, right? And if you look at the economic theory behind a product, I mean, there are different theories, right? There's the, the Keynesian, there's the Fried, Friedman theory, there's multiple economic theory. Uh, of course, there's some theories that say that the value of a product depends on the labor that goes into it. There's some theories that say that the value of a product depends on what the market will pay for it, right? Uh, but at the end of the day, everyone agrees that a product has to address a specific need. And in today's day and age, that need can differ and, and there are different ways of com competing and different ways of being competitive or differentiated in, in that space. Like for example, if there's a direct need, you provide a product and, and that's, that's one way. If there's a need and there's a product already in the market, you provide a product at a lower cost. That's another way. Or you basically focus on higher quality, like for example, what the Apple iPhone does. Uh, like that's, that's kind of like the Rolls Royce of phones at a higher premium price compared to other phones. Or you basically have a product that performs better uh, or, or is better at achieving specific niche objectives, but still addressing the broader uh, requirement. But broadly speaking, there is a need. There is something that's supplied for that need, and that's basically a product in terms of economic theory. Uh, I just Googled the best-selling products of all time, uh, and, and this is the list that I got. And, and of course, I'm a Star Wars fan. Who isn't, right? Uh, shout out to all Star Trek fans, I guess. Uh, but, but it's interesting. Uh, Sony PlayStation is up there as, as one of the key products. Uh, Super Mario is, of course, there. Uh, and and nin that, that basically propelled Nintendo's fame as well, Super Mario, and then the games that uh, Nintendo released, including, I guess, Pokemon as well, right? Uh, later on, I'll be talking about the network effects of APIs and, and economic value. And Pokemon Go was basically one of the fastest to reach 50 million users because of its network effect. Right? And, and that, that's a really good example. So, so there are products that really made it, uh, really made it big and, and, and started and sold really well. Right? But at the same time, as with any product, there are product blunders as well. That maybe the, the product quality was not good. Maybe the price was too high. Maybe the product was too early to market, right? Maybe the market was not really ready for the, a product of that scale. Uh, there's a lot of examples in the past, uh, basically, 
iPod and the iPhones and the iPads basically hit. But then there were variations of that. There were the MP3 players of the past, right? There were variations of that that really didn't take off, uh, similar to how the uh, iPod took off, for example. Uh, this is one of my favorite examples in this diagram, the, the DeLorean. So if you're a Back to the Future fan, uh, I've got my Back to the Future car there. You can see, so I'm a fan, right? So anyways, uh, if you're a Back to the Future fan, uh, you would know about this, right? So, so the DeLorean came out in, I think, around 1982. Uh, again, it was a futuristic car, but it was a flop, right? And, and, and of course, I'm just quoting USA today. The link is down there as well. Uh, they did get their act together. And, and basically, I'm guessing in 1985, when Back to the Future was released and, and Doc writes this, uh, Doc's time machine, right, uh, basically. Uh, but at that time, it was too late, right? The popularity increased. There was a surge in, in uh, interest after the Back to the Future movie, uh, like one, two, and three. But then it was too late for, for the car, for the model itself. And I think the, that division went bankrupt in 1986. Uh, the diagram next to it is, is quite interesting. I found that quite funny, which is basically Cheetos. Uh, if, if you haven't had Cheetos, of course, it's like a cheesy flavored chips. Uh, and this is a Cheetos lip balm, right? I've, I've seen like honey based lip balms and, and like flavored lip balms, like different scented lip balms, yes. But a Cheetos flavored lip balm, eh, not, not so much, right? I wouldn't, I wouldn't use it. Uh, so that was a failure. So th th there are a lot of product failures, right? So these product failures, of course, come and, and that's, it's common sense, right? Why, why they happen. Uh, maybe again, as I mentioned, it's too early to the market, but maybe you predicted something wrong. There was not enough market research or, or the, the, the group, the research group that you're working with uh, or the sample size you're working with is not really accurate. Right. So, so you come up with the wrong ideas. You put a lot into manufacturing and then basically uh, the product fails. So that's true of physical products, tangible products. We have been making the point and driving the point home that APIs are the products of the 21st century. And, and, and there's, there's no doubt about that, right? There are many organizations, there are many unicorn organizations uh, that have made it within the last decade who have like achieved like mass scales compared to the large brick and mortar organizations in the past, right? And, and so that they are all, they all have some kind of underlying service interface, underlying API interface. So APIs are the product of the 21st century. Uh, and of course, if you go through the points, I'm not gonna go through every point, but basically that's how digital value is delivered, right? So as APIs, and this digital value, these APIs can be monetized either directly or indirectly. Right? So, so that's, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, these are intermediated or traded or marketed, right? So you treat them as some kind of an encapsulation of an asset. I'll go into that in detail. Uh, and not just between organizations, not just B2B or not just B2C, or as Nuan pointed out yesterday, uh, B2D, right? Not just that, but then within the organization as well, right? So Within the organization, you have business units, you have functional domains, you have SBUs. They come up with their, or they, they own certain code, they own certain services, they expose these APIs, and those are consumed by different teams. Right? So there are different reasons of uh, exposing APIs, but granted APIs are the product of the 21st century. Uh, and, and we touched upon a few of this. There are really good examples out there of these products of the 21st century, right? And, and again, there are different forms that these are taken to market. I mean, there, are, there is a direct monetization channel versus an indirect monetization channel. Uh, some of these API products are used as like a backbone for other components, other products, other initiatives. So there is really an indirect value. So there's a direct value or an indirect value as well. But in, 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 if you look at any API, from an economic perspective, you can actually attribute a value to it. And you should be able to attribute a value to it. And then that's one of the cores of the core concepts of this uh, session as well. Some of these organizations have external facing API marketplaces, right? Uh, like for example, uh, Cerner is one of my favorite examples. So Cerner basically is the one of the po most popular electronic health record 
system companies in the US and globally, right? And, and uh, if you would have listened to Murad's talk from Prime Therapeutics yesterday, uh, so that's a popular system which many providers and then some payers connect to, right? To fetch electronic health records, electronic medical records. Cerner has an uh, um, external marketplace and they also have an internal marketplace and, and they go above and beyond to make that marketplace concept work. And, and we'll talk about those examples uh, in a bit. Proximus is uh, one of our customers in the US, uh, sorry, in the, in the EU, in Belgium, to be specific. They were formerly Belgacom. They are currently uh, one of the largest telcos uh, in Belgium and in EU. Uh, Proximus has a bimodal IT uh, model, right? Uh, so basically, they have the stable APIs that they expose via a stable API marketplace. Some of that is internal, some of that is B2B, just to partners, and some of that is external. But at the same time, they have a, a rapid API platform, a, a platform where their innovative teams, their, their testing and R&D teams basically expose a beta APIs, similar to like the Google beta APIs, for example. And that is then put into a market where external third-party developers can come try out these APIs, right? So if these APIs are successful, if they have a successful business case as well, if that business case is proven, if the technical case is proven, uh, if the performance and stability, everything is proven and the quality is proven, then they move those APIs into a production uh, kind of setting, which is not, not really production, but, but a stable setting, uh, which is their uh, standard API gateway. Right? So they have that bimodal IT uh, model going on as well. And, and many interesting examples from uh, here as well. All right. So we spoke about APIs being the digital product. And the reason why I spoke about physical products is because you need to really think of APIs from that perspective as well. Yes, APIs have special characteristics. They are intangible. They can change. You can ask for versions of those APIs. They can be available as a service. You can pull back an API whenever you need, so on and so forth. Right? So there are different characteristics, of course, of intangible assets. But at the same time, there, there is a lot of value when you bring economic thinking, the standard product thinking and the product practices into API strategy as well. And, and there have been in the past a lot of failed API initiatives. So we've spoken about a lot of good, stable, strategic and successful API initiatives during uh, yesterday's sessions. Uh, we'll be talking about a lot of uh, initiatives and a lot of projects today as well. But uh, let's, so just looking at the practical side, there are a few projects that fail, right? And, and this is project management 101, right? There is a number of, there's a large percentage of projects that don't re reach the time goals, that don't basically adhere to the cost goals, uh, that basically fail from a requirements perspective, et cetera. And the same is true for API products as well. Now, this screenshot uh, or this diagram, if you can see that, uh, like basically focuses on like the security aspects, right? And these are actual examples, uh, the, the Venmo payment example, uh, the T-Mobile API bug, Instagram APIs, so on and so forth, right? So, so there's some actual payloads, et cetera, there. So these are examples that were in the media, that were in the, in the industry that got a lot of visibility. And these are of course a, a core part of the failures, right? The security failures. Prabhat will be talking later on, Prabhat is our security guru, and, and he'll be basically talking about the whole security kind of the side of things and, and how API security comes into play in a digital supply chain, right? I'll leave that to him, he's the expert. Uh, my session here is basically on the value. There are many failures that really don't come to the fore, that there isn't, there isn't too much media coverage around where you, an organization sets up a, an API platform and that doesn't provide the required value to the required end users or the intended end users. And that's a big problem. And, and that's, that's basic, and we've seen this. Now, I've worked uh, personally with a large number of enterprise customers, uh, and I'm part of a solutions architecture team, and, and as part of the sales team as well, we, we've worked with like 1,000 plus integration projects, API integration projects during the last 15 years. And during that time, we've seen a fair share of projects that have failed uh, basically, since the value, the business value of that platform doesn't really uh, stand up to what the organization is expecting or the organization has 
thought too far ahead and they are not really ready to consume APIs. Uh, one such example is from a telco services company that, that we worked with. Right? So this, this company was providing like a telco API product. Uh, they had a very aggressive plan. They, they had a plan to take out a specific uh, competitor. They wanted to achieve a certain percentage of a certain market segment. So all was good. Uh, there, there was a really good forecast as well. Well, uh, we worked with them and they had like forecast for three years, forecast for five years, so on and so forth. Uh, but then in two to three years, the platform had to be shut down. And, and the real reason for that, and, and that whole team let go and they had to reevaluate everything. The reason for that is, it's, so they had exposed the APIs. APIs was a buzzword. It still is a buzzword, right? Uh, so you just, you need to expose APIs. Someone from the top comes and says, hey, I need APIs. Uh, I need to expose APIs and I need to check that box, right? Uh, so you expose the APIs, but you really don't work on the extra as aspects, the marketplace aspects, the aspects, uh, sorry, uh, sustainability aspects, right? The economic aspects. So, so that's that's key, and and that's why value is an important thing, and that's that's really what I'm trying to drive home here. Right? All right, moving on. So the way I see it is, value can be broken down into three broader categories: the economic value. One is at an individual level where you have value APIs, right? So that's API value, and we'll talk ab about some economic principles there. And these are my economic principles. This is not from a book or or somewhere else, right? So but I borrowed stuff, right, obviously. Uh, and then, of course, you have the API value chain. So we've been talking about the supply chain, right, and how a digital integrated supply chain works, how API management is really part of a digital supply chain, and how the, the, the sum of the parts uh, make up the whole, right? So we'll talk about an API value chain, how, how value flows in a chain. And then we'll also talk about API value networks. Let me see, uh, I'm getting some pings. Okay, this is nothing to do with me. All right, cool. Uh, and then we basically talk about API value networks. Uh, I'm just going to go uh, mute my chat stuff and take it from there. Perfect. Okay. So step number one is basically the individual value that an API provides, right? Uh, so as I mentioned, there's the individual value, there's the group value, there's the chain value, and like there's the network value. Okay, so economic theory number one of Mifan, which is basically focus on VPIs, uh, so value programming interfaces. Uh, this is a term that I've come across here and there. It's not a popular term, but it makes a lot of sense. There is a lot of concern about what an API is. Like when, when people start getting into the technicalities of APIs, there's this question of what's an API? Is this really an API? Should I put this on an API gateway? Is this a service? What, when do I really make call it a managed API? So on and so forth, right? That's, that's the technicalities of the API. But for me, an API provides value. So, so a, a better terminology for some of those concepts is, is a VPI, a value programming interfaces. And, and when I talk to some of our, our prospects and customers and, and, and users out there, uh, they, they have said that it makes sense, right? Uh, there was a really interesting article from Christian Costa uh, some time back on, on, on basically API gateways going through an identity crisis. So that's really the technical side of things, right? So if you're not sure what an API is anymore, uh, you really don't know what an API gateway is anymore, right? Where is an API gateway? Like, for example, Kasun had a really great session on microservices yesterday and, and how, how the whole microservices landscape works. So within that, API management, API gateways have a huge role, but where and when is what really Christian talks about. But that again is the technical angle of, of the, the story, right? So if you look at the business angle, the value proposition angle of an API, it, it then makes a lot of, it has a lot of clarity and it makes a lot of sense, right? But if you haven't read this, it's a good article to go read. Um, so for my next concept, I'll, I'll take an example. Uh, this is basically a, a telco services company, uh, basically Dialogue ASEAT. So uh, the ASEAT group is one of the largest telco groups in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, they have around seven subsidiaries, including uh, Cellcom, Dialogue, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, 
uh, so Dialog is in Sri Lanka. So if, if you're in Sri Lanka, that's that's one of the largest telco providers there. Uh, so sometime back, they came up with this whole API management platform by abstracting the large amount of services internally and came up with an API marketplace. And those are some stats around that. And that's that's the actual API store that's built on WSO2. Right? Uh, but if you look at the telco industry, telco is a really great example of, of how APIs need to be used. Uh, so telco data was really uh, proprietary data, right? And then that was, and data was gold and telco had a lot of data. They, they collected a lot of data, like petabytes and petabytes and terabytes of data. And, and basically telcos kept them within that. But then came over the year providers like Skype and Twilio and so on and so forth, uh, who started taking away certain parts of the telco business, right? And, and that, and then telcos, had a threat, uh, they had an existential threat. Uh, do you innovate? Do you expose your proprietary data? Or do you basically uh, fall into the weeds and, and give way to these over the air providers, right? So there was a period of time, uh, as you would know, uh, where there was a, a lot of confusion on what telco agencies need to do. And that's a really good case study. Uh, so that really brings me to the second uh, interesting point where you can look at APIs as an encapsulation of intellectual property, right? And we'll take that same telco example and go through these points just to drive the point home. So point number one, organizations have different forms of data and technology assets, right? So if you take a telco, the telco has a lot of data, my call data, my location data, my buying uh, data, my purchase data, for example, the internet usage over a longer period of time, right? Couple that with market data and environmental data and there's a lot of data that telcos have and that's really data is gold right data is the intellectual property these assets are internal right so so it makes sense to basically make reuse these assets either for an internal purpose or an external purpose so exposing that technology asset that data as an api immediately uh, enables it to be used or reused right? and when you start reusing something you really have a compound effect on it, right? It's not just a simple curve, like you compound because when two people use it, it it's a log curve. And when two more people use it or two more people in their network use it, it increases logarithmically, right? So there's a compound effect and that means a compound effect on the return of investment as well. So really you should start treating APIs as an encapsulation of that, of your intellectual property. Because if you take the example of a telco, Data is one of the key intellectual property, right? A lot of theory in here, but that's basically the point I'm trying to drive. Uh, this is a diagram I borrowed, a diagram that I use quite often from Visual Capitalist, uh, which, which basically talks about the key drivers uh, behind APIs, right? So, so basically, uh, and, and that's, that's interesting. You can see a large number of organizations look at APIs as a way to develop new partnerships. Uh, a way to drive revenue, a great way to exploit newer business models, et cetera. Uh, in some, some cases, as a way to comply to regulations as, as, as uh, the healthcare industry in the US shows us, uh, or the open banking, the financial industry shows us, there's a great talk on open banking and the financial API industry today as well. Uh, and, and then of course, ways of differentiating from other competitors, uh, et cetera, right? No one introduced a, a terminology, or who, he actually spoke about a, a concept of accidental innovation yesterday, which is quite interesting, right? So, so you, as, a, as an organization, you basically expose APIs and then people start building applications around that, those APIs. I needed to throw trash in the morning. I just moved into this house. Uh, so the township has an API, right? So what other third party developers have done is they've basically built applications that use those APIs and then basically send us reminders and notifications, et cetera, on, on when, the when you should throw your trash, it sends you reminders of what you should do, it sends you notifications, all of that, right? That's simply because the township decided to expose this as an API instead of just writing a website, putting up a website and, and doing a direct database call, right? It's just a simple step, but it's a futuristic step. So that's our principle that we looked at, right? Uh, so the second principle basically is that APIs are the encapsulation of intellectual property. And that's an interesting way of looking at APIs from an economic perspective.
Principle number three, the API value chain. So basically what that says is value increases as it flows through the digital supply chain. Uh, let me take an example from the yesterday. Right? Murad from Prime Therapeutics spoke about uh, Prime's ecosystem. Right? I'll, I'll start mapping that here to see how that maps into the whole physical supply chain. And healthcare already has this concept of an integrated physical supply chain, right? So you have the providers who are the hospitals. Uh, HCA is one of the larger hospitals in the US and Tim will be doing a talk later on today on, on HCA's success. You have payers, like who are the insurance companies, healthcare insurance companies, like in the US, the Blue, the Blues, Blue Cross Blue Shield, uh, Kaiser, uh, United Health, so on and so forth, right? And of course, all of them serve the patient. And, and you need to have a patient who is like this, who is smiling, right? Uh, not just the head, of course, but who is smiling, who is happy. And, and all the whole ecosystem is supposed to make the patient happy, who is the most important stakeholder here. And how do they do that? So the patient works with the provider. He gets uh, care from the provider. The patient works with the payer. Uh, he gets the payments done to the hospital through the payer, so on and so forth. So there are interactions there. Now, these organizations don't work in isolation. They, of course, work with suppliers who have who work with the pharmacy benefit managers like Prime Therapeutics, who serve providers and payers, as, as Murad mentioned yesterday. There are vendors like, let's say, Cerner, for example, that I spoke about, a W2 customer, uh, who basically provide services to providers. In, there are specific specialized vendors like claim management systems serving payers, so on and so forth. Right? So there's an integrated supply chain uh, that goes on. Uh, in Asanka's presentation, we spoke about the 21st century integrated supply chain for APIs, right? where you have API product management, and that's really a supply chain. Right? It has to tie into API integration at the back end. You tie into the monetization and insights from APIs, DevOps, and management of these APIs. And if you look at that diagram, uh, and if you look at the value chain concept from, from Michael Porter, right? so, so basically value flows as we go along that supply chain. So you start with API integration, you integrate your backend systems, you basically bring in insights and monetization, so you're adding more value there. You're bringing in DevOps, you're bringing in management, observability, you're adding more value there. And you're basically bringing in API product management, you're monetizing the APIs, you're adding SLAs and documentation, so you are adding value there. And even when you look at a layered architecture diagram or, or, or distributed architecture diagram, where you have your utility APIs, you have your domain APIs that sit above the utility APIs and wrap those utility APIs, and you have your edge APIs that basically provide the experience to your end users. So your value is flowing from south to north, and, and that's the concept of the value chain. So you have to ensure that API value flows, uh, and, and that's a good way of measuring success. So if you look at the same supply chain from a value chain perspective, right, and, and think about what the fire regulation, the CMS rule in the US is doing. So what that is saying is, now the pharmacy benefit managers, the vendors, whoever is holding patient data needs to expose this data according to the Affordable Care Act in the past, and of course the, the CMS rule currently, to these various organizations in a FHIR-enabled API format. And at the same time, the providers and the insurance companies, the hospitals and the insurance companies, need to make that patient's data available to that patient. Right? So you are adding value at each step of the stage as the APIs come along the physical supply chain, and the patient finally gets an aggregated view with multiple layers on top of things, uh, where a provider talks to multiple, multiple vendors, multiple PBMs, multiple payers, but the patient gets the API value at the end. And that's the mark of a successful API program or an API ecosystem. But value chains don't end there, right? So principle number four is value networks, API value networks. Uh, so this is really where API marketplaces and platforms lead to sustainable, I bolded that, that's important, ecosystems and network growth, right? Uh, so very quickly, uh, if you haven't seen this, this is basically David Sachs's famous napkin diagram uh, when Uber presented uh, their business model to him, right? And, and, what, and this is really Uber's business model, right? So for example, 
let's say there's more demand. There's more demand for, that means there are more riders in the market and, and that leads to more drivers coming up, right? There's an economic principle there. If there are more drivers, there's more coverage, there's more coverage, there's faster pickup. And that means there's less driver downtime, which means lower prices, which means there are more riders who come into the picture. It's a circle, right? It's, and, and that's an economic, uh, it's a platform business model. Uh, and, and basically it works. Right? And then that creates a sustainable business model. It creates moats. It brings in different kinds of players and it basically enables uh, network level growth. So if you looked at Metcalf's law and Reed's law, so on and so forth, you would see that there are different ways a network can grow uh, logarithmically or in different models, right? It's not just one-to-one. -one. Uh, Shiro will be going next. She'll be talking about API marketplaces and I'm, I'm, I'm trying not to take uh, time or thunder from her session. Uh, but if you look at API marketplaces, it's a really important form of business platforms. It's the core of business platforms, right? It's not just a simple API management platform. It's not a simple API developer portal, but you go beyond that. So if you take the CERN example, right? So they had the producers who produce APIs. You have the consumers who consume APIs, the applications. Uh, but they also went above and beyond and conducted workshops. They conducted hackathons. They did a lot of evangelism. Uh, we, I worked with an organization who, who tied API usage into the performance appraisal of the developer. Right? So that, that's, there are gamification models, so on and so forth. Right? So uh, basically, that's, that's the platform. And if you look at the network effect, uh, there are same side network effects, which means because there are more sellers or more producers means better products, right? better APIs, better incentives for more buyers. If there are better APIs, if there are good APIs, then you basically get better buyers or consumers, right? So, and a better platform. So there's more buyers, more users, competition, which is healthy for a platform. Right? And then of course you have cross side network effects like the Uber diagram that I showed where, where it's a full circle. So, um, so you need to think of this as a bigger picture and not just if you're going to come up with the next Uber, right? That's, that's not everyone's goal. Even if you're coming up with an internal marketplace, you need to make sure it's sustainable. You need to make sure it works, it's economically viable, and it really makes sense, right? You just don't do it for the sake of doing it. Uh, there's a few good examples, like, like uh, this diagram is, is from HBR, which talks about the Airbnb's network diagram, uh, which has a different uh, competitive advantage versus Uber's network diagram, which has a different competitive advantage. And you should be able to create these types of networks. So now coming back to our healthcare marketplace diagram. So if you make it a healthcare marketplace, then you add the ecosystem onto that, right? Uh, so you had the healthcare apps, basically an app ecosystem, the ONC and CMS in, in the US under, under human, uh, the health and human services department are expecting a, a huge surge in healthcare apps and the healthcare app ecosystem, which would mean there'll be the rise of the app marketplace. There'll be lots of healthcare apps coming out there. Your, your Apple Watch, your Fitbits will start working as medical devices, as, as devices that pull your personal data from multiple sources, not just that device, right? And then there will be the whole digital healthcare companies that are already happening with, with COVID. It's accelerated now. Digital transformation is accelerated now. Uh, and, and that's going to lead to a lot of innovation in this space, right? So that's what the API marketplace can enable. And providers and payers and PBMs and everyone in this ecosystem need to realize that it's no longer good to just keep hanging on to your intellectual property. It's time to basically expose these APIs as APIs and look at the bigger picture value that it would bring, right? And, and you need a platform, of course, that can scale towards your requirements. So like if you need to build a distributed system, you need a platform where you can enable like these decentralized architectures or your centralized architectures or a mix of both, which can be deployed on the cloud, which can be deployed hybrid. Uh, and, and this is a diagram I borrowed from the session yesterday, which shows the full picture of WSO2, not just API management, integration and identity access management, not just the open healthcare solution and open banking solution, but the different individual components which you can take and deploy independently in different places, right? And then that's really what will help you scale your architecture. So it shouldn't be too large that you are limited uh, by, by what you can do. And it shouldn't be too small that, where you, that you have to put in a lot of effort to manage and uh, manage the overhead and observe the whole platform, right? 
So I think WS2 has, we worked for 15 years in this domain and, and we've gotten it right. Okay, so, so that's basically this session. Uh, hopefully that was useful. And I'm really setting it up for the rest of the day, right? So, so Shiro will talk about API marketplaces. She'll, she'll go into details there. Uh, Tim will talk about, uh, Tim from HCA will talk about HCA's journey uh, in, in the fire space. Uh, Dustana will talk about basically the open banking uh, implementation and, and help uh, financial APIs. So there are a lot of great sessions. But key takeaways from mine, uh, so APIs are not just a technical resource. Don't treat it as just a technical resource, right? They are important parts. They are encapsulating your intellectual property and they are value APIs, right? So you also need to pay, pay some, like you need to give some importance to the value chain, the integrated value chain where value flows from your stakeholders, from your physical supply chain, as well as your digital supply chain. And, and basically, all of this is true whether you are building an internal platform or whether you are building the next big Uber. Right? It, it's not uh, totally separate and it's not mutually exclusive. Right? Uh, but you cannot achieve this vision without having a platform that can scale, the platform that has done this before, uh, which has all the components, not just API management, but you need identity access management, you need integration, you need specialized solutions for health and uh, banking, so on and so forth. Right? You need everything. And of course, uh, look at WSO2, right? So that's basically my session. Uh, hopefully I'm on time or just a few minutes over. Uh, so talk to us. There's a few takeaways here. Uh, I've linked to the WSO2 contact us page. Uh, you have a lot of people you can talk to today. Uh, since I spoke about uh, the fire domain as well, I've just linked to the healthcare solution. There's a demo there that you can go try out. That's for the fire regulations in US and globally. Uh, email me if you have any questions uh, or hit me up on LinkedIn or, or Twitter. Right? And, and I hope to uh, talk to you soon.